Brooks bio, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and call on Mr. Brook to come on up and begin. So let's give Mr. Brook a <laughs> Thank you, Paul. You're very welcome. I met Paul uh, a month or two ago, yeah. I would say, something like that. And uh, I always think it's the best compliment you can give somebody when you get to, you tell them you want to be like them when you grow up. Because uh, <laughs> I just, I love his energy. And I must say, I have to comment on this. I'm fortunate enough. I was, so where's John? Where, where's John? Just saw him here somewhere. Oh, he is. Anyway, I was telling John, I'm fortunate enough to do two or three talks a week. Qantas, Lions, Rotary, Chambers, schools, prisons, all sorts of different places. I'm, I'm really, very fortunate to be able to go. And I must say, Kiwanis, uh, some of the memberships have really struggled in the last few years. And so it's just great to see this many people. And normally I wouldn't dress up this fancy, but I'm a member of uh, Rotary downtown Seattle Four, so I will be there <laughs> noon today. Not that I wouldn't. <laughs> but they're, a great, they're a great group. What are you doing? Yeah, exactly. So, but it's great to see some familiar faces, Darlene and Lou and... And then I'd seen John before as well. And then, of course, when I met Paul, as I said, I was very impressed with his energy. Let me start uh, very quickly with a show of hands. How many people here have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? Okay, about 70, 80 percent. And so I actually, you were mentioning Mariner, Paul, and I actually get to do commencement speeches too. And I'm going to be doing a commencement speech at Kamiak and Bothell High School and a few other in June. And so I get to speak from kids all the way from 18 up to I do a lot of rest homes. 80, 90, 95 is sometimes the average age. And so it doesn't matter, no matter how many people are there, it's always about anywhere from 50% up to 80, 90% of the people raise their hands. And the reason this is significant for me is because I want to tell you about my significant personal loss. It was September 29th, 1998. It was a Tuesday. I remember it like five minutes ago and I woke up and I looked over to my right and my wife wasn't there in bed. It's about 6.30 in the morning. I wonder what's going on. Just as I wonder where Dana is, Connor, my four-year-old, comes in and goes, where's mom? I don't know. Let's see if we can find her. So we get out we walk down the hall, and my 14-year-old son, Kyle, same question. We don't know. So we look in a couple of rooms, and we walk down, and we look downstairs. And in front of the washer and dryer, here's Dana, crumpled over, and she's all hunched over, and it doesn't look good. And I go running down there. All three of us go down there. And I turn her over, and there's stuff coming out of her mouth, and it just doesn't look good. Connor starts crying, what's wrong with mommy? I said to Kyle, go call the police, call the fire, get everybody here. And within a matter of minutes, probably 20, 25, 30 people were in our house. And they had all that stuff and the wires and those paddles and things like this. And when you go through something like this, it's very surrealistic. And they had those things on the, the, the electric shock and things. And again, for those that have raised their hands and have gone through anything that's even close to this, one of the things that I figured out is that time loses all measure. So you don't know how much time has gone by. Your body's in shock. And I noticed that I didn't know again how much had passed. And this short fire person comes over to me and says, Mr. Brook, we've been working on your wife for an hour and a half. We still don't have a heartbeat. Do you want us to continue? And I sat there and I just thought about it for a minute. And even when you're in shock, your brain still manages to work to a degree. 90 minutes, hour and a half. And I said, um, no you can stop and she was dead and she was 38 and very very young and what made it so tough for me and again I feel I, I'll say this several times during this talk about how fortunate I am to be the person that gets to stand up here and tell this story and talk about gratitude and the gratitude journal and what really changed my life but a lot of times people that can't stand in front of crowds or don't want to talk to other people will talk to me. I, I sell some books in my journals and so forth. Will tell me stories that, that just curl your hair, that people have gone through really a tough, tough time. Well, for me, it wasn't only Dana's loss, but my father had committed suicide earlier. He was a very prominent attorney. And my mother had died of cancer. And it just was on and on and on. And here I am, it's about 15 years ago now, going, I don't understand how I'm supposed to proceed with life. I don't get it. And a couple of days after she died, I walked up to this little deck we had by the house. We live by Green Lake. And I remember pinching my skin and just going, I'm just a guy, another human being, just trying to get, I don't know how I can do this. And I thought about it, it was just all by myself, because our house had tons of people coming around those first few days, bringing food and trying to help the best they could. And I thought, now I see why people kill themselves. 
I really kind of get it because it's just too painful. It's too, I've been through too much. So once again, I kind of thought about that for about five minutes and then I thought, I'm not going to do it. It's not going to do it. I mean, you take, once you take the decision off the table, it's no longer an option. And I've got to raise these two boys. They're four and 14 and their mom is gone. So I'm going to stick around, but along the way, I'm going to have to figure out a couple of key things that are going to be helpful. It's one thing to make a decision. It's another thing to have the tools and the mindset to take you where you need to get. And one of those tools and mindset to me was how you look at something. You have to decide, are you going to go left, right, glass half full, glass half empty, whatever it might be. So I'd like to ask you all to stand up, if you would, for a second. There's very few audience participation things here, so don't get upset. <laughs> you better not call on me. I see that look all the time with just fear. So I want you to take your right hand and extend it high and just start turning it in a clockwise manner. Now, we are in a digital world. A lot of people don't know what clockwise is anymore. I, I find, especially at the schools. Well, there's a clock right there if anybody's uncertain. So that's clockwise. Listen to that knocking right on cue. I like that. And so keep turning it clockwise. Now just start bring it down real slowly, bringing it down. Bring it down to your forehead, your eyes, your chin, your waist, or your chest rather than your waist. Now what direction is it going? Lou, I expect you to get this. What is it? Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise, thank you. Okay, you can sit down. And so, <laughs> see there's always, thank you ladies. Okay, what is, what is your name? What is your name right behind Lou? Michelle. Michelle, and what is your name? Annie. Michelle and Annie. Thank you both. Because it's there's always a couple going, and it just it just it just makes me feel so good because I have these fraternity brothers that would comment on me. You're not the same after Dana died, and we always stayed together for 40, 45 years. And and one of them recently said, "Yeah, I came to one of your talks. You're not that great." I, I said, what, was, "He goes, what's the story with the circle thing?" He says, I said, you're a freaking MBA. You should understand this stuff. I said, no, it's just how you look at it. It's above or below. It's just, it's just gosh, it's just my way. It's something other than a glass half full or half empty. So as I realized, gratitude came into my life a little later, but I realized a couple of key things. And again, when I get to hear these stories and people email me when I get to do all these talks and so forth, it's thrilling to me to hear these stories one on one. But one of the things that I noticed is some of these key elements I figured out is not only did I figure out I needed to embrace gratitude, which was going to completely change my mindset to one of the things I have in my life versus things I don't have, and realizing I'd lost my wife and all these people, but I have all these wonderful things that are still in my life, which we lose focus on. But I realized it takes as long as it takes. It takes as long as it takes. I am 64 years old. I wanted to be a speaker when I was 19. And I left, I managed Nordstrom stores, I managed Lowe's home improvements and so forth. And I only left Lowe's two years ago and I walked out one day and I told Connor I'm going to be a speaker. And he goes, what are we going to do for money? I said, I'll figure that out along the way. But it's the journey that we have, 64. And Lou, I mean, he looks at me and he goes, God, he doesn't look a day over 63. You know, I, I can read minds. But it doesn't matter, everybody's journey is separate. Colonel Sanders was 64 when he started KFC. And Stallone had, Walt Disney, they had to go to two or 300 banks to get financing for Disneyland and the Rocky movies and so forth. So it doesn't matter. And when I love, and people ask me, the very first question I get, I don't even think Paul asked me this. Where's your PowerPoint presentation? I go, I don't do PowerPoint. Because I just, it just drives me crazy. First of all, you can't look at people. And then people are clicking and sometimes they just want to, can you just give us the slides? I mean, you're just reading the slide. I don't understand it. And I like to be able to look at people and you can see in people's eyes whether you're resonating or whether or not they can relate or whatever, that maybe they've had a loss or something. But one of those things is it's your journey, not even the people on either side of you. Dave with a great name here, Alan with a great middle name, David. You know, even, even it doesn't matter. And so many times we do, I, did, I do a video every single day on gratitude. And I send out a featured one on Monday. The one last week was comparison is a thief of joy. We, oh, get a bigger boat. She's better looking. He's more handsome. They've got more money. It just, it's ridiculous. It's your journey. And that's something that's such a key part of this to understand about it takes as long as it takes and it's your journey. But I want to talk about also this never, ever, ever giving up. That was Winston Churchill. So Connor was four, as I mentioned at the time. And about two or three months later, he was struggling in preschool. And they said, you know, your son's really messed up. That's exactly their term. And I said, his mother just died six months ago. 
yeah, 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 he's, but he's messed up. So they put him through all these tests. And when we were done, they said, have him go sit over there. And I sat here and they said, your son has got all sorts of problems, mental, physical, emotional. We're going to have to do all these special programs and so on. And when it was all done, I said, as I mentioned, we live by Greenlight. And I said, you know, I, I, I think he's going to be fine. No, he's not. I couldn't believe it. And I said, I think he's going to go to Roosevelt High School and he's going to be the starting quarterback someday. She goes, he starts laughing. <laughs> no. No, he's going to have a difficult time. In school, in sports, in anything. So I went out into the car, got into the car, and I just burst into tears. And I probably cried for 15, 20 minutes all the way home. Connor kept saying, what's wrong, Daddy? I said, nothing, Connor. It's fine. Everything's going to be fine. But he kept struggling in life, in school, and in sports, and everything. And I realized maybe they were right. But just, he just refused to give up. So he played baseball. And you start out with coach pitch and t-ball. And t-ball, how many people here have kids? Again, a significant number. Well, you know, t-ball, the ball just doesn't move. It just sits on the tee. There's no movement. It doesn't curve. It just sits there, and he couldn't hit it. And I go, Connor, I, and I was a decent athlete. And he, so he'd be swinging up here. Go, no, the ball's down here. So he kept lowering it, lowering it. Finally, he hits the tee. The ball dribbles forward. And he goes, I got a hit. <laughs> Bless his heart. But it just, not how the game works, Connor. But, but he kept trying. He just wouldn't give up. So we went through the different levels. And we get to August 31st, 2005. Or excuse me, May 31st, 2005. And we're playing a game. And he never plays. And so it's the bottom of the seventh, and it's seven to six, the other team, and there's two guys out, and there's a guy in second and third. And I think, frankly, I never asked the coach, I think there's no kids left. Because guess who comes out of the dugout? And he's just swinging a bat like he's, you know, Babe Ruth or something. I'm just going. <laughs> and he looks, and no, kids never do this. He looks in the stats, Dad, I'm up. And he waves me. <laughs> kids don't acknowledge their parents? Are you kidding me? And he goes, so he's up there, and he's swinging it around, and all of a sudden, it's ball one, ball two, and it's full count. The next pitch comes in, he just rips it down the third baseline, just inside the bag. Guy from third comes in, the guy from second hits third rounds, comes in to home. The ball, Connor, the catcher all come together, the guy catches it, they crash at the plate, the ball pops out. And they win the game. They win eight to seven. He's standing on second base, and from second base goes, Dad, I got a hit! <laughs> <laughs> the entire team goes out to second base, puts him on their shoulders, and carries him off the field. To this day, it still gets me emotional. I had such a big lump in my throat as I always get when I tell that story. But we came home that night, and uh, later that day rather, and we sat on the bed and I said, Connor, it was never ever about baseball. It was about the fact you wouldn't give up. And he never gave up. And Kyle didn't either, my older son. And Connor ended up going to Bothell High School, that's where he lived. And he graduated last year. There's a smaller picture of him. He's now six foot two. And he was the leading hitter on the Bothell baseball team. And now he's down in college down in San Diego. And it just reminded me so often when I get to talk to groups and, and different people, and I'm on mastermind calls and things like this about you just can't give up. You just can't give up. But once again, it's important to have tools. It's one thing for me just to sit here and tell you you can't give up. But I realize if I get something like gratitude, which I'm going to mention in just a second, if you never ever give up and it takes as long as it takes, I don't care how old any of us are or aren't, it doesn't matter to me. It's your journey is again, is it your opportunity, is it your journey? But you've also got to make room for gratitude too. You've got to get rid of junk. We have a lot of junk in our brains. And when you go out and get in those cars today, notice this windshield's about this deep and it's about this wide. And then notice the rear view mirror is about like this. It's pretty good to keep it in that proportion. You know, mostly look in front of your life, pay attention a little bit to the back. If you see some flashing blue lights, you may want to pull over. <laughs> we, we don't want to get in trouble. But mostly pay attention to what's in front of you. Now I will tell you, I do workshops and things where we get into a little more detail. And one of the things I notice is that we drive over junk and then we, it's behind us, and then we pick it up and we put it in front and we drive over it again. And the best example I can tell you is when somebody's honest is when people talk about their ex-spouses. Gosh! Well, if it wasn't for my ex-husband, if it wasn't for my ex-wife, and I go, 
when did you guys get divorced? 83? <laughs> That's like 30 years ago. You're driving over the same junk. Gosh. When is it going to be your opportunity to have your life? I don't care about this ex-spouse. I know that stuff's not pretty, but gosh, it's got to get you got to get rid of this stuff. So, this buddy of mine says to me, "You need to get a gratitude journal." Now, how many have ever heard of a gratitude journal? Wow. That's a that's a pretty good I had never heard of it. I've heard of a journal and diary. So, I get this gratitude journal. I do it a lot of people. This is mine, but I just ordered one from Amazon. I ordered it and I just put it on the shelf for two or three months, didn't touch it. And I thought one day, maybe you ought to start writing in this. And I started writing in it and I noticed a huge difference. Because it reframes everything, as I said earlier, that you have versus you don't have. And it's so easy. I was talking to Paul earlier with that incredible energy he has. Yeah, there's clouds up there, there's rain, but there's also a sun up above those clouds. It just depends on how you want to look at it. So along the way, I developed my own called the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal and I sell a lot of these and I sell them online and I sell some other books too but I tell people you can buy mine or get a spiral notebook I don't care this takes five minutes a day and the, the saying that I talk about is if you think about it it's like a dream if you talk about it it inspires you but if you write about it it empowers you and the reason this is important is because those same schools I go to questions from the back and there's always a question yeah do you have an app is there like an app I can put on my phone for the gratitude journal? <laughs> and the funny thing is, I have an app. And, and, it's, and you can use it. And there's the gratitude journal. I am so grateful to Paul Sellis for inviting me today. I'm grateful to see Darlene again. And it'll type it. Wow. But it's not the same. It's just not the same. There's something about getting a thought in this CPU up here we call our brain. Goes to our heart, our arm, our hand, our pen, and the paper, and I write, I am so grateful to Paul for inviting me to Muckle Teal Kiwanis. And you can go back and reference it later. You can see why on certain days you did better than others. Well, the structure that I used on this, this is my actual journal, and um, because I was up early this morning, so I had to be here early already writing in it. And so people will come up afterwards and they go, Is this your journal? And I go, um, Yeah. And they go, You write it every day. Have you heard the presentation? Were you like listening this morning or? No, you just write it. I'd say you just brush your teeth occasionally. I mean, it, it really works. But the way this was structured, I don't expect you to see it from here, but day and date. And then here's this daily number, which I'll talk about in a second. But here's a couple of current events that are going on. And I've timed this 100 times. I don't write on every line. I just write big and so forth. It takes five minutes, maybe six tops. Here's what you're grateful for. Here's the highlight of your day. And this is everything you're going to be grateful for, called your gratitude intentions on the right-hand side. So it's amazing how your mindset can get changed by writing everything you're grateful for. So here's what I'd like to do. The daily number is this. 10 is one of the best days of your life, and 1 is one of the worst days of your life. So I want you all to think about right now where you are, what your number is this morning. It's uh, 8.07 in the morning. Not your neighbor, not this. And somebody goes, well, should, the number I was last night. No, right now. What, just what, whatever you think you are right now, I want you to get that number. And so I want to kind of get a sense of the people in the group this morning. If you're between a one and a five, I don't want you to raise your hand. If you're having a tough day or tough morning or what have you, I don't want to embarrass anybody. But just by show of hands, how many people are a six? Okay, one, two, sevens. A couple, eights. Wow, that's a pretty good number. Nines? Wow. And any tens? Wow. What's your name? Wendy. Wendy. Congratulations, Wendy. Thank you. All right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to step back for a second. I want you to think. I usually have people write this down. I just finished talking about writing, but we didn't really don't have time for that today. What is the biggest thing you're grateful for in your life? And again, you're not sharing it with anybody. It's just you, yourself, and I, those three people. I want you to just think about that. And I used to give people ideas, and I know what it is for me, but nope, this is what you're most grateful for. And then as soon as that's planted here, I want you to think what's the second thing you're most grateful for. Number one and number two. You just think about them. Just think about how those impact your life, the gratitude you have for that aspect. Two. And then third and last is what was the highlight of your day yesterday? What was the best thing that happened to you yesterday? Connor is six foot two, wonderful, 3.5 student out of Bothell. They said he'd never make it. And my highlight of my day often is in San Diego when he calls me to say hi once or twice a week and he goes, 
I love you, Daddy. He still calls me Daddy. And if that doesn't warm my heart, I don't know what would. That's always the highlight of my day. So think about that. The thing you're most grateful for, the second thing, and then the highlight of your day yesterday, best thing to happen to you. Okay, so plant that in your mind, and then let's try this number again. So again, one to five, don't raise your hand. Sixes? Okay, sevens. Okay, eights. Holy oh, cow. <laughs> Couple. Nines? Quite a few more. And any tens? Thank you, my work is done. Uh, <laughs> great to see you. I appreciate everybody. <laughs> I actually, I don't do, I do that all the time. Every so often it's the same and I just go, okay, so listen, it's uh, clear I haven't made, but it's so important and when you write it, it's even more powerful. As I said, when you're writing it, and my biggest thing at 64 is my health because I've had 25 to 30 people die in my life and that's why I needed to find something like gratitude to kind of save me and what I noticed is that half of those 25 to 30 were of their own hand. Suicide pills, booze, it's just ridiculous. It's one thing to get unfortunately hit by a bus, it's another thing. So that's what really helped me. And I will tell you about this daily number for me, why this is so impactful for me. My mother was manic depressive and then she died of cancer, but she would always, always struggle with this depression thing. And she would call me when I was working at the University Bookstore and going to the University of Washington, before she died of course, and she'd pick up the phone and she'd take these pills and she'd go, David? I have these sleeping pills and I'm going to take all of these unless you come over and see me. Oh, man. And that's how depressed she was. And she'd shake the pills like this. And what am I going to do? I'm like 16, 15 years old. And uh, Mr. Gallup, I need to leave. My mom doesn't feel good. So I'd go over and sit with her. What do you say? But I think I got some of that depression stuff from her. And I am not going to take pills. Dana died of a prescription pill overdose of Vicodin and Oxycontin. And she'd been arrested for prescription fraud and she was in Everett, Providence for, it's just terrible. And, and so, again, it's, so, it's such a waste to me and she never beat it. And then she eventually overdosed on that September 29th day. Well, I think I got some of that depression stuff. So I woke up one day about a year ago and I was a two. And I just was not feeling good. And I thought, you better get your journal. You better go down to Starbucks right now. So I drove down to Starbucks and I wrote in my journal everything I was grateful for. And it bumped me up to about four or five. So I felt better, but I still wasn't eight, nine, the Pauls and the attitudes, the Lou's, the people, you can just tell. Lou said, I'm on a minimum seven, eight, and always it's up. And it's just so neat because we control this. It's a choice we have. And people that are positive or negative, well, you don't understand, Dave. It's a choice. You can decide to be grateful. You can decide to be positive. It's, not, it's your life. It's nobody else's. It's not these parents and things. But I still wasn't quite right, so I had to talk at Burlington Chamber. And I went up to the Burlington Chamber, and when the talk was over, about 200 people, this gal comes up to me, and they line up, and I'm selling books, and it's just thrilling to me. And she goes, you just changed my life. Her name was Janice. And I looked at her, and she was crying. She had kind of tears, and one of your stories, and I said, which story? She goes, I can't talk about it. It's too personal. But I just want to tell you, I'm going to get a couple journals of my son and some other things, and she gave me a hug, and it was just really thrilling and I, I fortunately get that a lot but since that day and before so I go out to my car up there in Burlington if you ever wonder who your best friend is in life who's the first person you call when you get really good or bad news that, that's how I would tell so I wanted to call Connor first and then I wanted to call Kyle but I thought you know what I'm just gonna enjoy this and I had a big smile on my face and I just thought gosh Dave you're changing lives you're impacting people and I realized it was a nine and a half and I'd gone from a two to a four or five to a nine, nine and a half. And I didn't take one pill, drink a bottle of beer, take an antidepressant, I mean all these things. I'm not saying that those don't have a place. But what I tell people is what this gives you is a healthy coping mechanism in a world of tons and tons of deadly destructive ones that kill people. And it's not only having that mindset, but it's also the journal to write it in and so forth. So um, last thing I want to talk about and that is, and by the way too, I have a little sign up over here. If you want to get this, this weekly video, you can sign up and I send it out every, morning at, uh, every Monday morning at 7.45. And that is, embracing gratitude is the first thing I figured out. Never ever give up. It takes as long as it takes. Make room for gratitude. Clean out the junk in your brain. 
get a gratitude journal. They always, I do radio quite a bit, and they always say the same thing. Mr. Brooke, the gratitude guy, what's our final thought for the listeners? I go, just try a gratitude journal. Just try it. People try so many other things that have deadly consequences, as I mentioned. But the last thing is sharing gratitude. So here's what I'd like to do. One more audience participation. How many people here, since I've been talking, have used their smartphone? Darlene, I see a couple. So we got five honest people in the group. I was doing, I was doing Kirkland Rotary a couple nights ago, and the guy goes, I, can I show you what I put on here? And I go, yes. He goes, get a gratitude journal. I went, okay. So I want you all to take out your smartphones. Take them out, because we're going to do something real quick. I'm going to give you 60 seconds to do something. I call this the four T's. Text, tweet, Telephone, they used to be used for that, or tell somebody how grateful you are to have them in your life. So most people end up texting, but whoever you want, go ahead. I'll give you 60 seconds starting now, and you can tell the person next to you too, but telephone, tweet, text, or tell somebody how grateful you are to have them in your life, whoever you want. Okay, about 30 seconds to go. Do you think most people have business cards if I give away a book? Do you think or no? Business cards, do you think they have business cards? I think they have some. Okay, we could maybe, do you want to do that? Do we have time to do that or no? Okay, we'll do that real quick. Okay, 10 seconds. And stop. So of course you can you continue that you can continue that later today. Uh, I will tell you it's the way these things have changed. Of course, I have my little stopwatch on here as well. Not many people use them as a telephone. I mean, it's just sort of funny how it's gone. But most people they're just going tweeting away or texting or whatever it might be. But a couple of weeks ago, I was I could hear this guy right over here, and he was using this as a telephone, and he goes, "Yeah, I just want you to know how grateful I am for you." I, th I had a feeling it was his wife. Uh huh. Yeah, I don't know. Some speaker just told me to call you and tell you. And I just, I just went. No, no, that's not it. So, so last thing I want to do is I want to. Does it, do most people have business cards here? People, business, business cards. cards do, you have do you guys have business cards? So let me. I would just. I'm gonna have Paul just collect business cards. I want to give away a book real quick, and I'll just draw a name. And I just want to. As Paul is collecting those. I just want to talk about how many people here have ever written a book? Anybody? Oh, wait a minute, Wendy. What is it? Your Anne? That's what you said originally? God, what's happening to me? Sorry, Annie. How long ago did you write it? But it's, it's tough. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. And, and the reason I bring it up is because on books that I've done, I've done some anthology things where you have different authors and I would send in an article and it just kept getting rejected and I noticed over and over again if you stick with it, uh, there's Lou's car, if you stick with it, it goes back to that same thing I said about never giving up. So, but the neat thing about it is that you try to make a difference and people want to see things on their, la or their smartphones as I said, some people want books and so forth. So, uh, let me just draw one here real quick and we'll see. This one, I'll just leave it here, thank you. Uh, Lou. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> so, well, so, I'm grateful. Thank you, Lou. So Lou, Lou saw me speak at Muckleteal Chamber several months ago and I probably related the story then. So I always, in big groups, there'll be like 200 people and I try to get either the coupons or the cards and I collect it, like the tickets. And so I, so I gave away, I gave away the book and the gal comes up, Sally Smith, and they all clap, and yay, and I call her name, she comes up front, there's a podium, and I handed her the book, and I said, hey, congratulations, Sally. I said, Annie, how did I forget that? I try to pay so close attention to names. I said, congratulations, Sally, and I said, you know, if you'd like later, I'll sign that for you. And she goes, that's okay. So, <laughs> 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 clearly, I have not established myself as anybody 
worth getting a signature for. So, Lou, 20 bucks in it if I can sign the book for you. So, yeah, I'm giving you 20 if you'll let me sign it. So, last thing I just want to leave you with is this idea of when you find something that is really important, the last piece is sharing it because that's why I wanted you to share gratitude or share who you're grateful for. We, I don't think we do it enough. I was fortunate enough never to be a drinker or drugs or dope and all this nonsense. But I was always kind of an adrenaline junkie. And so I did a lot of those bungee jumping and I've flown for a long time with hot air balloons and things. But we went to, I was going to go skydiving. So I got seven fraternity brothers and we all made an appointment on Saturday. And so it was that week and on Monday I noticed two of them kind of dropped out. And then by Tuesday, it was like down to five, and then Wednesday, it was four. And then Thursday, I got a call, uh, Dave, <coughs> I have a sore throat. <coughs> I don't think I can make it. So Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, I walk proudly up to the counter at Issaquah Skydiving, and they go, hi. They go, can I help you? And I go, uh, Brooke, uh, party of eight for skydiving? <laughs> and he goes, uh, where's your friends? I go, I don't have any. And I went by myself. <laughs> and I skydived by myself, and I have a picture of it where they take it down, like all out of the airplane. But I didn't get to share it with anybody. And so you really realize, and hopefully you'll see either now or later today the response you get from those texts. But when you get to share it, it makes something so much more fulfilling. So I encourage you to embrace gratitude. Don't give up. It takes as long as it takes. Make room for it. Get a gratitude journal, a spiral, whatever and share gratitude. I feel it can change and transform a life. I feel in my case, it saved my life. And it can save you guys' too. Thanks a lot. Oh, oh, hold on. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, very much appreciate it. And oh, perfect. Uh, I need small some. token of our appreciation. Thank you. Share it, if not to use it, but you can fill it with gratitude or anything Excellent. else. So, thank you very thank you, much, Paul. sir. Yes, thank you absolutely. so much. Uh, the reason why I didn't uh